You'll feel that you know Lise because you've seen her on television. And I know you will feel a warm feeling towards her. And that's because her reporting is such a rare combination of intelligence and authority and compassion. And Lise is a rare person in so much as she is genuinely warm and wonderful. And everyone in the BBC who has worked with Lise will tell you that she is lovely. <laughs> now, lots of people say nobody gets to the top by being lovely. Um, but Lise um, has managed to do that because she's the BBC's, um, what is it now, chief international well, correspondent. <laughs> um, and she's a genuinely wonderful person. Some of the people who you see on screen who um, have very warm um, and wonderful broadcasting personas are not actually like that in real life. <laughs> <laughs> but Lise is. So I thought that my, first we might reprise uh, the sp speech that she gave in accepting her honorary degree today. Um, for those of you who were not at the cathedral. So you began with a piece of poetry. Yeah, Shane Mussini. Tell us about which that. I'm sure. But first can I say, first, uh, Winifred and I actually worked together in 1999. In the World like, Service. In yeah. the World Service and in the dark of night on the BBC World Service they had started this new program. And so I also met the lovely Winifred at a time <laughs> of night where people actually are often not quite lovely because they're tired, they don't want to be there. And we used to sit just desks apart doing this program, The World Today, and this is, was the first time that we worked together. And I, I have to say that when I do come back to England, the first thing I do, of course, is I have the radio on in all the rooms of my flat. And so I often hear Winifred on the radio, on Radio 4, and it brings back this really warm recollection of the times that we worked together. And Thank I was you. so excited when I knew that you were coming here and to find out that you were a Liverpool girl, and that somehow, by association, that I can become a Liverpool girl too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to bask in your, in your glory and in your, your sense of place here. Uh, and I have to, I, I do want to thank everyone for making me feel so much at home here. Someone with a funny accent from one of the former colonies, and you made me, you know, feel part of your your family. And and it's very kind of you to talk about compassion and empathy. But I, I, I feel I'm in a place where not only is the surrounding magnificent, but the spirit is magnificent. Because I, I spend most of my time in countries where religion is something which is not something in the text. Religion is part of community. And I came from a very small community of Catholics and Protestants on the east coast of Canada. And my interest in religion came from that religion was part of life. It was what you did, it was what by, you know, bound communities together with the Catholic Women's League when someone died or someone married, when something happened. They were always there in the same way with the Knights of Columbus. It was community that brought people together. And every conversation I've had since I've come to Liverpool has been about not just bringing small communities together, but worrying about the world, about what was happening in Rwanda, what was happening in Bethlehem, what was happening in India or South Africa, that all of you here live a world where the world is very much part of who you are and, and what defines you. And so I feel it's a very comfortable feeling to be here. And in that sense, I, I feel at home because your home is the home that I inhabit. I always say I, I live in a country which is called the world and London, or let us say tonight, that Liverpool or Liverpool Hope University is the capital. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Now tell us about Seamus Heaney. Yeah. <laughs> Seamus, do you know, Seamus Heaney, I mean, it, it's very interesting. Poetry, and I, I don't know whether this is with you, Winifred, there's a number of people now who are journalists, like Jeremy Paxman, whose name, of course, you must know, like a very dear colleague and friend of mine, Lindsay Hilson, who's the international editor of Channel 4, Alan Little, who's one of the greats of, of the BBC, who is one of those people who is wonderfully compassionate on screen, one of our best writers, and in, in his own life, personal life, is an extraordinary, extraordinary person. But they have said that to be a good writer, to be a good broadcaster, you have to love poetry. 
you have to be interested and enjoy the structure of poetry, the simplicity of poetry, the directness of poetry. And you probably know as well, Winifred, in, the, in our daily lives as broadcasters where you have to read so much of all of us, you have to take a moment if you really want to, to, to find poetry and to reflect on poetry. And Seamus Heaney is one that I've always found, both in the poem that I cited today, which has been for me something that I've, I've literally, I've mounted it on a, on a board and framed it and have taken it with me from country to country. It's, it's something, a, sort of a motto I live by. But he also had this great, um, uh, this thing about the conscious of our uh, republic of conscience. And it was very funny, it was, it was actually, and this is not to drop names, but Vanessa Redgrave talked to, to me about when I interviewed her one time, and she talked about Seamus Heaney. And again, it's, it's, it's something what I've, it's, it's what I've just talked about, how he talked about the republic of conscience. And I, many of you, I don't know whether, do, do a lot of people here know about Seamus Heaney, the Irish poet, and how he wrote, and there's a number of people nodding. And the Republic of Conscience, which Amnesty International took on. And it's this lovely idea that, because of course we are bound by our frontiers. I'm, I'm Canadian, I was born in Canada. We talked about, I was speaking to uh, here at our table about, you know, is one South African? Are you New Zealander? Are you Australian? Are you, we sort of have this idea of our, this where, sort of a geographical context. But Seamus Heaney called on us to think about our world as a, 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 a community of belief that our country is defined by us and the people who inhabit this country are those who share our beliefs, our conscience. So it's your conscious and not the geographical boundaries that define your country. And just think of it, if we could say that this, this was our country, we'll give it a new name and this is all part, we're all countrymen and women because what binds us together is not that we have the same passport but the same conscious, the same spirit, the same bent of mind. I, I just thought it was just a wonderful idea. And of course he does things, he talks about digging with potatoes and getting his soil under the fingernails. He's very much rooted in the soil in so many different ways. So I've, I've carried that way. I'm sure all of you here have your favorite poet, your favorite Tell us song. the lines again that you, that you opened with today. Um, it's, very, it's very simple. The, the, the way we are living, timorous or bold, will have been our life. And it's lovely because I find, I find sometimes we can get so bogged down in the detail of our day. We worry about this or that. But if you look back on lives lived, and everyone here has lived an extraordinary life, it's the grand sweeps of things, the emotions, the feelings, the, the great you know, movements in your life that you remember, the moments where you rose to an occasion. That's what you remember. You don't remember that you're you wore the blue dress instead of the red dress, or the, you made this call or didn't answer this email. or So it calls upon us to rise from the worries of life and just go boldly. And uh, so it's, it's a good rallying cry. We don't always do the right thing or do the bold thing, but it's good to be reminded that we should. Now, my job is to ask the questions that all of you would like to ask. And the first <laughs> question that comes to my mind when I see Lisa's, where does she find the courage to do it? So where do you find the courage in yourself, Lisa, to be there in those very dangerous situations? I, I always think that when, when people come up to me and say, oh, I'd really like to do what you're doing, and I say, but you would do it if you had to do it. And I really think that ideas, and this is not, not to be self-deprecating or, you know, falsely modest, whatever. I think all of us get up in the day and all of us face risks, challenges, dangers, because all of us see that within the world in which we inhabit. Some of us get up, and when I'm in London, I get up and I think, oh, I don't want to make that phone call. And I laugh at myself. I'm thinking, I'm fearing this phone call. No, come on, Lisa. And I'm just, no, no but, no, but I'm just saying, because again, it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind. I know there are more physical risks, but each of us every day has to get up and face the challenges of How our day. How do you face those and physical risks? Because well, you were there, weren't yes. you, when the um, assassination attempt was made on President Carson? Yes, you do. I mean, obviously, you know, I go to places which are at war, and it, it's no laughing matter. It's you're in places where mortars could land and do land. You're in areas which are unpredictable, where there are suicide bombings, where 
increasingly, and this is one of the greatest risks faced, we were just discussing at our table, journalists, aid workers, are not just kidnapped by accident, they're targeted. People are looking for you, and if you don't get taken, you're just lucky. But if you go to certain areas, it will happen. So you don't go. I don't go to those areas. You take, as I said today, you, you take calculated risks. So, but, uh, you know, I, I spoke to Lord Guthrie about it today, that the further away you get from a place, the more dangerous it's, it's, it seems, which is not to say there isn't danger. But I have found time and time again, whether I'm going to Kabul or Aleppo in Syria, Damascus, Gaza, that in these places you are, you are, so enriched and inspired by those people who have to live day in, day out in those circumstances and can't do like I do and leave. You know, I go in, we assess the risks, we get people, sometimes we have people coming, security advisors coming with us, otherwise we go ourselves, but we, 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 we check out the terrain. And I always, always work with someone from the country because no matter how many years I spend in a place, no matter how much of the language I know, the country I know, I will never know more than the person who lives there, who has it under their skin. So I always work with an Afghan in Afghanistan, a Syrian in Syria, a Gazan in Gaza. We work with a driver that we know and trust, who you feel is part of family, because drivers, in more ways than I want to count, have made the difference between life or death to go to stop when someone stops you or not to stop when someone stops you because of the wrong people who will, who will not, are not policemen, people pretending to be policemen. But the way that people, reach out to you, they, you know, I always say in the places of greatest darkness you find the light, and the graces of greatest inhumanity, you find the humanity. The family which has one piece of bread and they will share the piece of bread. One meal left and you will be brought into the meal. You're humbled by their extraordinary courage and compassion. And you feel privileged to go to, to these two communities. I feel it's a privilege to be able to tell the stories of our time. And, you know, I don't go to the places where there is a, you know, high risk of kidnapping, where the, the bombs are falling. I go to dangerous places, but you make decisions about which places you go and which places you stay away from. Of course, you take risks, but they're calculated risks. And it's uh, to say what they would say here with a hope and a prayer. <laughs> you go. Well, thank you for doing it for <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah. Um, what I feel about Lisa's reporting is that, um, when I see international news, I want an account that is not partisan, and um, I want an account that is not sectarian, and I want an account with humanity, but I don't want to feel that my emotions are being manipulated. Mm. Um, and how do you do that, tread that path between um, being, I suppose, emotional and being empathetic? It's very interesting you ask this question because, as, as you, and you ask it because you know, uh, this has become a big issue in journalism. And for those of you who follow discussions in the media, and some of you may, and some of you may not, is and it came up after the Gaza War. Uh, I came out at the same time as Jon Snow, who I don't need to tell you is an, an icon in, in British journalism, and I have great, great respect for Jon Snow. We came out at the same time from Gaza, and he. He said to me, he said, you know, I feel guilty leaving because it's, this has really, really affected me. And if you saw his reports, he spent time with the children in the hospitals. And, and for every journalist who was there, for everyone who was there, it was, it was a traumatizing time. You know, I came back and I couldn't watch pictures of the news again. When Jon Snow came out, he did a video, and some of you may have seen it. He didn't do it on Channel 4 because Ofcom rules would not allow it, but he did it on the internet in which he did it quite emotional. It was balanced, because he talked about the suffering of Israelis as well as of Gazans, and really it was a plea for, if you listen to it carefully, it was a plea for this madness of war to end, so that Israelis and Palestinians could live together. But it was also a plea for the children of Gaza, and that what he had seen, had, it really, really marked him. And that provoked a discussion among journalists. And I suppose as the kind of journalist, you know, we were, I was discussing with the Bishop of Liverpool, actually, and I'll, I'll give you the example we used. Um, is what is how, is it all is it acceptable for journalists to become emotional to show their emotion and is that part of what we do? John Snow decided it was part of what he do. At least he wanted to be in public with that. My view is that it's not it's not part of what I do. I work for a public broadcaster. I believe absolutely, and I think I speak for some of my colleagues in this regard, in being empathetic. 
you know, I have a job which doesn't allow me to take sides. I can't take the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, but I feel no reservation in taking the side of children, in taking the side of people, because they have nothing to do with this war. They are innocents caught up in a conflict. And the saddest observation for me now, and we did a, a story, a film for BBC Two about the children of Syria, because I went to the controller and I said, in the wars of our time, they're not the wars of our fathers and grandfathers or grandmothers and mothers in which women and children were the, you know, the vulnerable and the innocent, you had to take the women and children out. Women and children in the wars of our time are not simply on the front line, they are the front line. They're not caught in the crossfire, they are targeted. In, in Syria today, children as younger than one year old are tortured. Children are shot by snipers, their schools are targeted, they are the real victims in this conflict, which is why I said to the BBC, we have to listen to the children. Because not only are they the targets, but they can tell their stories and they can tell the stories themselves. So we decided to do it. But again, when we did that film, it wasn't me crying, and I did cry, but off the screen. It was about, let's listen to the voices of the children. And I was speaking, if I may, I was speaking to the Bishop of Liverpool about this. And you know, he sadly tomorrow has to do a funeral. He has to be the man who stands before the, you know, the person with the great authority, great wisdom, a great position. He could break down crying. He could also show emotion, but that's not his job. His job is to be there to show strength, to be a, to be a source of strength for the community. What do journalists do? We're there to tell you the stories of others, to give, for those of us who may see the job in that way, to give voice to the voices. But it's not our voice that matters. It's a voice for someone else. And similarly, in his job, that is what, you know, for the job of, of someone who has a, a senior position in, in, in the church, there to be a spiritual reference, to be a source of consolation, a source of strength, but not the story, not the person at the center. Of, and I think we agreed on that. And for me, that's it's very interesting. And it was mentioned today, Michael, very kind. Where is Michael? He mentioned, yes, it was, it, was a, it was a realization for me one time when, at a time when there was a lot of suicide bombings in Jerusalem. And you know, whenever something like that happens, for, for days after, everyone says, well, if I hadn't gone to pick up my grandmother, I would have been you know, in that suicide bombing. If I hadn't gone to X rather than Y, I would have been there. Because you always say, oh my God, so, a close brush with death. And I was walking through on Jaffa Road, past the Mahani Yuda Market, and those of you who know Jerusalem, it's a very vibrant market, and I thought, on my way to the office, and I thought, should I go and get some apples? And I thought, no, I've got apples already. In. So I walked and I turned the bend in the road, and poof, I heard the noise, and then everyone freezes, and you look around, and I'm thinking, was that a you know, gas pipe, or was that a suicide bombing? And so you look around, and I said, and people were running, and I said, is that a suicide bombing? And they said, yes, it was a suicide bombing, and I think, do I go to the office, or do I go back to the scene? So I went back to the scene, so I arrived, in time to see Mag and David, which is the ambulance service, is arriving. The people with the, with the most grisly of jobs picking up the fragments, sorry for tonight, flesh, uh, but also the ambulances. And I watched them. They, they concentrated on their task. Their task was to pick up the injured, to pick up the dead, to attend to, 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 to the victims of this horrible bombing. And I looked at them and I thought, and what is my job? My job is to get on the telephone, to call London and to report exactly what was happening all around me without emotion, but with some understanding to put it into context. So while the doctors worked, I as a journalist worked. And that's what it is, whether you're a priest or a professor or a doctor, we all play our part. We all have a role to play when things go wrong. And sadly, they go wrong all too often. But it's really, really important to remember what it is that we do and we, we're not the ones who are at, you know, the great suffering the most. We're there to help those who are suffering or in effect to help them in some way get some consolation or some help in the, in the process. Well, you're very, very modest, but um, you know that a lot of war correspondents, <laughs> they go a bit batty, you know, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, and a lot of them spend their latter years, don't they, locked in offices um, drinking and they get dried out a lot um, at the expense of news organizations. So how do you bear it, Lise? Your war, this great writer, Anthony Lloyd of the Times, wrote this book and from Bosnia, he says, oh my war, I love it so. 
And you know, I even heard Alan Little on, and I thought, wow, Alan, when you say that on air, <laughs> you know, about missing, you know, he said I was embarrassed to say, you know, I loved covering the war. And I, you know, Lord Guthrie may say, you know, the soldiers, you know, you get caught up in it. There is this in in our profession about the adrenaline. We all have a certain amount of adrenaline in our jobs for different for different reasons. I don't. I mean. You don't I don't, have know. That. I, I, I don't want to go and get shot at. And, uh, um, but when you come away, how do you erase the pictures? How do you Well, there's certain things it? you try not to see. And I, again, I won't go into discussion because we're here, because now we were talking again at our table about the savagery that we're seeing with the beheadings. And um, I don't want to look at them. I don't want them in my head. I don't want to. I don't know. I, I, think, I think when you come away from it, when I come back to England, what do I feel? I feel grateful. I come back to peace. I come back to rule of law, institutions. And I think it's, you know, people sometimes say they come back and they say, I feel guilty, you know. I feel guilty having this kind of nice wine and sitting here. And, and I say to people, I said, how can you say that? The people who, you know, as we sit here tonight, the people who are in prison, the people who don't have any food, what would they want to do? They would want to be here. They would want to be here in the oldest of biblical traditions, breaking bread with us, sharing food, sharing wine, sharing companionship. And if we say, no, I'm not going to do it. I feel guilty. Other people are not. Then we are, de we are denying the very thing that, all, that people fight for. People fight for this privilege of meeting as friends of people, you know, bound together by a certain empathy in a peaceful society, and we're going to say we're not going to do it? But that would be a travesty. Last question, because we've come to the end of our 15 minutes. <laughs> um, since you were talking about guilt, what I sometimes wonder... Catholics. I know we're Anglicans and Catholics. When you brought the Catholics into Liverpool home, you brought the guilt, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now the Anglicans are going to do. <laughs> I don't know if you feel this, but when I hear the news now, as Lise was saying today, the world is a smaller place, and so I'm conscious of the fact that stories that would never have been at the top of the bulletin are now right at the top. Um, and sometimes I think, why, why, why is she telling me this? Because what can I do? I thought the mm. girls, you know, the, those little girls um, who were kidnapped in Nigeria by Boko Haram, the top of the news. Mm. So you wake up in the morning, you turn it on. And then I, I think, why are you telling me this? Because what can I do? So what can I do, Lisa? Mm. What can we do? Do you know, I often say that, you know, it's what I said today, and you know, because I've had many discussions in my family, and there's a joke in my family that they say, oh, Lise always says, oh, expand your horizons. And my view is that always you should go away from where you, where you were born, you know, what has formed you. Because every time you visit a new place, your eyes are different. You look at things in a different way. And even if you just, you know, one of my sisters went to the next province and saw something different and came back. And she's very happy that she's still where we grew up. And, you know, it's like I said today, whether you go across the world or across your country or down the street. And, you know, Winifred, you do a lot about consumer affairs, you and yours. You know, my view is that you should just do something. You can help the woman, next, or the family next door, the family down the street. You don't have to go all the way to Africa to do something. But I think, you know, and I, what I'm saying now is very much, you know, call it Christian, call it human. You, if you want to say about journalism, whatever you, however you want to say it, musicians, whatever, whatever people do, just do something. Some people will help people in Bethlehem. Some people will help people in Liverpool. I think once you decide that, you know, our, our destinies are all bound together, that we all should do something for somebody else. And I think that's where it starts. And if everybody did something, then I think we'd have, it would be an easier time to help, you know, everyone who's in need. Unfortunately, in place, you mentioned Nigeria, which is a, it's there, which should weigh heavy on everyone's conscience. It was a year ago, almost a year ago now, that 300 girls were kidnapped, and there was this great hashtag, bring back our girls. And they're still kidnapped. And the, and the greatest injustice of all is that you know, and I'm not going to get politi too political. The president of Nigeria made his first trip there. In nine months, he went to Maiduguri. Where was the president of the country? And there was this huge discussion about why did the media cover France 
and didn't cover Nigeria. And I think people are absolutely right to criticize that, you know, we gave a lot of attention to France, what happened there, because it was tragic. Something good will hopefully come out of it, but something bad happened. And why didn't we do something about Nigeria? Well, you know, European leaders all stood up and said, we cannot, you know, for, we cannot allow this kind of violence to happen. And Kofi Annan, when he was asked about this, he happened to be in Nigeria. He said, well, where's the solidarity of African leaders? Where did, why didn't the African leaders stand up? Why didn't they come together? He, and this is from Kofi Annan, a Ghanaian, former Secretary General, said, you know, we can't expect the international community to do anything. And if good luck, Jonathan takes nine months to go to Maiduguri, and it just happens an election is going to happen next month, then you know, it has to begin at home. The leaders of the country have to take responsibility, and then we help them to help themselves. I think that is how it has to, has to go, and that is the, the best way to try to make the world a better place. It, you know, again, back to my point, that everyone has to do, you know, its part, whether it's, you know, it's doing what you're doing, which is focusing on issues in Britain, and the issues are real, uh, whether they're consumer or humanitarian or poverty, whatever, and the issues, it's issues far away. Um, people will, you know, do something. They'll choose whatever they do, but I think the point is just to, to do something. So, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.